How many are ecstatic, erratic, and charismatic? Just checking. It's, yeah, God is... Oh, I was going to look for Kylie over here, but she's not there. God is good. God is great. Praise God. Let's open in prayer. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for the miracle of what we have in you, that relationship that is forever and ever. And we thank you, Lord, that uh, we're not standing in our own grace, but in yours. In the name of Jesus, amen. I stand to praise you, but I fall to my knees. The Spirit is willing, but my flesh is so weak, like the fire my soul, fan the flame, make me whole, Lord you know just where I've been, so light the fire in my heart again, I feel your arms around me, as the power of healing begins, your spirit moves through me, like a mighty rushing wind. Light the fire in my soul, then the flame make me whole. Lord, you know just where I've been, so light the fire in my heart. Let's sing that again. I stand to praise you, but I fall to my knees. The Spirit is willing. But my flesh is so weak Like the fire in my soul Fan the flame, make me whole Lord, you know just where I've been So light the fire in my heart again I feel your arms around me As the power of healing begins your spirit moves through me like a mighty rushing wind, like the fire in my soul, fan the flame, make me whole. Lord, you know just where I've been, so light the fire in my heart again, so light the fire in my heart again. So light the fire in my heart again. Amen. Woo! Wow. You are the choir. You should hear what it sounds like up here. Yeah, it's amazing. Praise God. What's it sound like in heaven? Woo! No wonder we can sing songs like that here, if the world only knew. Well, welcome to the house of the Lord, and uh, we're here to celebrate the Lord. And maybe if you look at our calendar, we have essentially the month of April and then May and then <clears throat> the first week in June that things are going to change and I'll let you know more about that but <clears throat> the gentleman that lives over here his family is going to take over the church first week in June and they'll be meeting at 11 o'clock so whether or not we want to stay or not you're welcome to come and just see what it's going to be like but we still have a month and a couple of weeks if you count this week so uh, we'll just see what the Lord has in mind for us hallelujah we also have a Wednesday night Bible study, if you're interested. And I think they may just let us continue our Wednesday night Bible study, too. So we'll see how that goes. Hallelujah. Strength arises, we wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. Strength arises, we wait upon the Lord, we will wait upon the Lord, we will wait upon the Lord our God. 
you reign forever, our strong deliverer. You are the everlasting God, the everlasting God. You do not faint and you won't grow weary. You're the defender of the weak. You comfort those in need. You lift us up on wings like eagles. Strength arises, we wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. Strength arises, we wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord our God. You reign forever, our hope, our strong deliverer. You are the everlasting God, the everlasting God. You do not fade and you won't grow weary. You're the defender of the weak. You comfort those in need. You lift us up on wings like eagles. Strength arises, we wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. Strength arises, we wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. <sighs> Waiting on the Lord is something this world knows nothing about. But when you wait on Him, He jumps in and takes care of us. In other words, we're letting Him go first. Let's sing this song. Blessed Jesus, come to me. Soothe my soul with songs of peace. I look to you alone, fill me with your love. Glorious, marvelous, grace that rescued me. Lord, for what you've given us, Lord. We give you praise and glory, Lord. Thank you, Lord. We do not stand in ourselves. We stand in you. We give you thanks. I am standing beneath your wings. I am resting in your shelter. Your great faithfulness has been my shield and it makes me want to sing Blessed be the name of the Lord Blessed be the name of the Lord I will bless your hope I 
sing praises to your name, O Lord. For you daily bear my burdens. Your great faithfulness is my reward. And it makes me want to see, blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. I will bless your holy name for all my days. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. I will bless your holy name for all my days. Blessed be How many are ecstatic, erratic, and charismatic? Right Just checking. It's, yeah, God is... Oh, I was going to look for Kylie over here, but she's not there. God is good. God is great. Praise God. Let's open in prayer. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for the miracle of what we have in you, that relationship that is forever and ever. And we thank you, Lord, that uh, we're not standing in our own grace, but in yours. In the name of Jesus, amen. I stand to praise you, but I fall to my knees. The Spirit is willing, but my flesh is so weak, like the fire my soul, fan the flame, make me whole, Lord you know just where I've been, so light the fire in my heart again, I feel your arms around me, as the power of healing begins, your spirit moves through me, like a mighty rushing wind. Light the fire in my soul, then the flame make me whole. Lord, you know just where I've been, so light the fire in my heart. Let's sing that again. I stand to praise you, but I fall to my knees. The Spirit is willing. But my flesh is so weak Like the fire in my soul Fan the flame, make me whole Lord, you know just where I've been So light the fire in my heart again 
I feel your arms around me as the power of healing begins. Your spirit moves through me like a mighty rushing wind, like the fire in my soul, fan the flame, make me whole. Lord, you know just where I've been. So light the fire in my heart again. So light the fire in my heart again. So light the fire in my heart again. Amen. <laughs> Woo! Wow. You are the choir. You should hear what it sounds like up here. Yeah, it's amazing. Praise God. What's it sound like in heaven? Woo! No wonder we can sing songs like that here. If the world only knew. Well, welcome to the house of the Lord, and uh, we're here to celebrate the Lord. And maybe if you look at our calendar, we have essentially the month of April and then May, and then <clears throat> the first week in June, things are going to change. And I'll let you know more about that. But <clears throat> the gentleman that lives over here, his family is going to take over the church first week in June, and they'll be meeting at 11 o'clock. So whether or not we want to stay or not, you're welcome to come and just see what it's going to be like. But we still have a month and a couple of weeks, if you count this week. So, uh, we'll just see what the Lord has in mind for us. Hallelujah. We also have a Wednesday night Bible study, if you're interested. And I think they may just let us continue our Wednesday night Bible study, too. So, we'll see how that goes. Hallelujah. Strength arises, we wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. Strength arises, we wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord our God. You reign forever. Our hope, our strong deliverer. You are the everlasting God. The everlasting God, you do not faint and you won't grow weary. You're the defender of the weak. You comfort those in need. You lift us up on wings like eagles. Strength arises, we wait upon the Lord, we will wait upon the Lord, we will wait upon the Lord. Strength arises, we wait upon the Lord, we will wait upon the Lord, we will wait upon the Lord our God. You reign forever, our hope, our strong deliverer. You are the everlasting God. The everlasting God, you do not fade and you won't grow weary. You're the defender of the weak. You comfort those in need. You lift us up on wings like eagles. Strength arises, we wait upon the Lord, we will wait upon the Lord, we will wait upon the Lord. Strength arises, we wait upon the Lord, we will wait upon the Lord, we will wait upon the Lord. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. <sighs> Waiting on the Lord is something this world knows nothing about. But when you wait on Him, He jumps in and takes care of us. In other words, we're letting Him go first. Let's sing this song. Blessed Jesus, come to me, soothe my soul with songs of peace. As I look to you alone, fill me with your love. Glorious. Oh, ho, 
you, Lord, for what you've given us, Lord. We give you praise and glory, Lord. Thank you, Lord. We do not stand in ourselves. We stand in you. We give you thanks. I am standing beneath your wings. I am resting in your shelter. Your great faithfulness has been my shield. And it makes me want to sing. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. I will bless your hope. praises to your name, O Lord, for you daily bear my burdens. Your great faithfulness is my reward, and it makes me want to see, blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be the Bless your holy name for all my days. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. I will bless your holy name for all my days. Blessed be the
Alrighty. The book of Hebrews is called Hebrews because it's written to Hebrew Christians. Isn't that right? It's a thick, complicated book because it's full of Old Testament truths. So you have to kind of read it slowly and it's a little bit of a work. But we're in this little section today where Jesus is our perfect high priest. Now people are forever trying to replace Jesus. I mean we got the Baha'i faith, they have Baha'u'llah, he'll replace Jesus. We have the Islam, they have Muhammad, he'll replace Jesus. We have uh, Buddha, Krishna. Why don't they just accept the real deal? Who Jesus is. I mean, and people also want to uh, <clears throat> replace Jesus by adding to his work. We have kind of a spiritual new math. Jesus plus fill in the blank. That's our answer. We're going to add some things. So uh, Jesus plus another person. Jesus plus another work. Jesus plus another ter- teaching. And it goes on and on. It never ends. Why don't they just accept the work of Jesus that was finished on the cross. You can't get any better than that. And that's kind of what we're at here. That Jesus is 100% our perfect high priest. We're going to look at Hebrews chapter 7, verse 23. And we'll go to 8, verse 6. Hebrews seven twenty-three. Now there have been many of those priests since death prevented them from continuing in office. In other words, there's been hundreds of them, but they all die. There's been many of those high priests since death has prevented them from continuing in office. But because Jesus lives forever, he has a permanent priesthood. Therefore, he's able to save completely those who come to God through him. Because he always lives to intercede for them. Verse 26, Hebrews 7, 26. Such a high priest meets our need. One who is holy, blameless, Pure, set apart from sinners, exalted above the heavens. Unlike the other high priests, he does not need to offer sacrifices day after day. First for his own sins and then for the sins of the people. He sacrificed for their sins once for all when he offered himself. For the law appoints as high priests men who are weak. But the oath, and he's talking about Uh, Psalm 110, where God swore an oath in Psalm 110. But the oath which came after the law appointed the Son who has been made perfect forever. Chapter 8, verse 1. The point of what we're saying is this. We do not have, excuse me, we do have such a high priest who sat down at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven And who serves in the sanctuary, the true tabernacle set up by the Lord, not by man. Verse 3. Every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices. In other words, for himself and others. And so it was necessary for this one also to have something to offer. Now, if he were on earth, he would not be a priest. For there are already men who offer gifts prescribed by the law. They serve at a sanctuary that is a copy and shadow of what is in heaven. That is why Moses was warned when he was about to build the tabernacle, see to it that you make everything according to the pattern that you saw when you were, that was shown to you when you're on the mountain. What a view he had of heaven. And so what's on earth is just a shadow of what's in heaven. <clears throat> Representation there. So it ends in verse six. But the ministry Jesus has received is as superior to theirs as the covenant of which he is mediator is superior to the old one. And it is founded on better promises. I'm worn out from that, you know. But I I want to highlight seven reasons to put our trust in Jesus, our perfect high priest. The first one is this. He is permanent. Now there's been many priests... Jesus is a permanent priest. I mean, they all have, all these other priests have something in common. They're all dead. Yeah, I'd like to help you, but I'm sorry, I'm dead. Put a, put a, uh, put a fork in me, I'm done. I mean, they can't help you, they're gone. So verse 23 says, death prevented them from continuing in office. I don't think Jesus is limited by death at all. Do you think, didn't didn't he, didn't he conquer death? I believe he did. What a high priest we have. The empty tomb matters. Jesus' ascension to heaven matters. He represents us. He mediates for us on a new throne in heaven. So verse 24, because Jesus lives forever, he has a permanent 
priesthood. He ascended to be our high priest. He's in heaven. Now, how permanent is permanent to God? If he says something's permanent, how permanent is it? Now, I installed a fence at our house many years ago, and the wood was amazing. It said, for a permanent fence. So I set it up, and about 10 years later, it dissolved in the weather. Well, it wasn't permanent. And football stadiums are supposed to be permanent. Remember Jack Murphy Stadium? They said that was going to be permanent. Well, they tore it down and even changed the name. I mean, uh, hair is even supposed to be permanent. But, but if you want to get it repermed, you have to pay money. And to get it re I mean, permanent is an interesting word. How permanent is permanent to God? It's forever and it's eternal. And eternal is a miracle. We can't even understand eternity. But it's here. It's in God. And it's very permanent. How could it be possible? Psalm 110 is quoted four times in the book of Hebrews. And it says this, the Lord has sworn an oath from Psalm 110. You, and he'll not change his mind. You are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. And I think last week we discussed Melchizedek. Melech means king, Zedek means righteousness. He visited Abraham, I think it's in Exodus or Genesis 14 or 16. I think it was 14. And it's also in Psalm 110. It's also mentioned here. A thousand year gap every time God mentions Melchizedek. So God put us on oath alert. Don't forget this. We've we got to know this. God swore an oath to himself. I'm swearing an oath. It's an intention getter on purpose. Think of all the other priests that have come along. Death is a pretty large obstacle for them to keep ministering, isn't it? Death has no power over Jesus, our high priest. He's a permanent high priest. And he's over what's called an eternal gospel. In fact, Revelation 14, John gets a vision of an angel. And this is what the angel says in Revelation 14, 6. I saw another angel flying in midair and he had the eternal gospel to proclaim. It's forever. To those who live on the earth, to every tribe, language, and people. So Jesus represents us to God forever. And when does forever start? Right now. We have eternal life, don't we? Now. Permanent priesthood. And he's also, the second thing, he's all powerful. Omnipotent. 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 Hebrews 7, 25. Therefore he is able. I think God is able and Jesus is able. Therefore he is able to save completely those who come to God through him. Because he always lives to intercede for them. Able to save. Now, do, this, this is amazing. Does humanity really need a savior? I mean, if you study human history and watch the news, isn't everything going really well for how many thousands of years? Oh, does humanity, let's see, do we need a savior? Well, who else can save like Jesus? Wasn't that his name at birth at Christmas? You shall call him Yahshua. Yahweh is salvation. Jesus. He's going to live up to that name. So he's able to save. And he's also able to save completely to the uttermost. It's pantel in Greek. Pantel. Pan all the way across. Tell to the end. Forever. He's going to save all the way to the end. So no one's salvation is left incomplete. I was just talking to somebody the other day that didn't think they were saved. And I've done that with people. Maybe you have. And if they're in Christ, they have to learn what salvation is. You are saved. Quit going back to what you think humanity demands of you. Your feelings. Go to the truth in God's word. So he's able to save completely those, plural, who come to God through him. No one is left out can be the rich, the poor, the educated, the uneducated, anywhere in the world. He's the savior of the world. Talk about inclusive. This world loves that name. That, you're inclusive as long as you don't disagree with him. But inclusive, there's no racism in the gospel. Jesus came to save the entire human race. Everyone. So verse 25 then in Hebrews 7. He's able to save completely those who come to God through him because... He always lives to intercede. That goes on 24-7 forever. He represents us. He's our mediator. Jesus rose from the dead never to die again. He ascended to heaven to represent us. He's, he's mediating for us in heaven. It gets no more powerful and no more authority 
than that. Now we have an accuser who lives just to accuse us day and night. And that's all he does. Now this accuser is no match for our intercessor, our mediator. And Satan, and really that's what Satan means in Hebrew, the accuser. (laughs) Satan means the accuser. He's the Antichrist. Can you get any worse than being Antichrist? If this world only knew. Uh, He's the anti-intercessor. No one's going to intercede for you. I've got it. And he's the accuser. He's always pointing his finger how bad we are. So here's what we can say to him. Of course, we don't talk to him, but this is what God kind of says. Accuser, I'd like to introduce you to my intercessor. Just for an example, we'll go to Revelation 12. We'll get a little bit of a revelation, apocalypse. The book of Revelation literally is called Apocalypse because Apocalypse means you turn things upside down, apocalyptic, it's just chaos. But it's good chaos because God's turning the world upside down. The book of Revelation, the book of Apocalypse. So here's 12 verse 10. John gets this vision. He has all these visions in heaven. I heard a loud voice in heaven, in heaven saying this, Now have come the salvation and power in the kingdom of our God. In the authority of his Christ, his Messiah, for the accuser of our brothers. That's Satan. The accuser of our brothers who accuses them before God, our God day and night. Verse 11 has been hurled down. Verse 11. They overcame him. How do we overcome him? By giving money? Uh, by trying to be nice? No. Here's how we overcome him. Verse 11. We overcame him by the blood of the Lamb. By what Jesus did. And then by saying yes to it. By the word of our testimony. That is what we have. They did not love their lives so much as a thing. In other words, they're willing to suffer and die. And that's what Jesus is our intercessor. So we have a permanent high priest who's eternal. We have a powerful to the uttermost high priest. We also have a sufficient and all sufficient high priest. He meets our needs totally 100% infinite need can't even measure it verse chapter 7 verse 26 such a high priest meets our need we have a needy world don't we this is where this is the 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 are met it's met our needs is met are met such a high priest meets our need one who is holy blameless pure set apart from sinners exalted above the heavens and our biggest need is holiness And holiness is probably the scariest thing on earth. You don't want to get near God's holiness. People just shrink from it. And and you read the book of Revelation, even John fall flat on his face a couple times. The holiness of God. So they'll fake the holiness. We'll do this, we'll do this, we'll do this. To try and cover it. You can't cover God's holiness. That's our greatest need. Without holiness, the Bible says no one will see God. Holiness means you're set apart. We're not, we don't belong to the world anymore. And we are. We're called out of the world. We don't belong anymore. So we need Jesus. He's outside the dirt of our existence. He's holy. He's separate. He's blameless. He's pure. He's set apart from sinners. Able to rescue. He's not in the mess we're in. He is separate. He's, he's eternal. He took on a body to dwell, in, uh, to dwell on earth and pay the just price for our sins. And then he's exalted to the heavens. Verse 26 Such a high priest meets our need. God is holy, Jesus is holy. God is blameless, Jesus is blameless. God is pure, Jesus is pure. God is set apart from sinners, Jesus is set apart from sinners. God is exalted above the heavens, Jesus is exalted. On and on it goes. He meets our need. Any depiction of Jesus that is less than this, he will lose his sufficiency. Because he is 100% sufficient. So we have cults all over this world, in liberal media. They want to strip Jesus of his sufficiency. So what they do is they add something. They've got to add, add things. It's either what we do or what we are. Can't possibly blame me. I mean, look at me. Look at, on and on it goes. Romans 3.23, Paul sums up the gospel pretty well in Romans 3.23. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of of God. I don't care what religion it is. I don't care what outfit you're wearing and what hat you're wearing, or what building you're in. All means all, doesn't it? All have sinned and then fallen short of the glory of God. So, uh, however, the next verse, we don't want to forget verse 24. 
However, we are then justified freely by God's grace. Not anything we did, it's by grace. Through Jesus Christ. Redemption by Jesus Christ. So we need to understand the gospel. The bad news first and then the good news. So Hebrews 7 verse 26. God is offering this miracle to the whole world. Verse 26, Hebrews 7. Such a high priest meets our need. One who is holy, blameless, pure, set apart from sinners, exalted above the heavens. Now Jesus proclaimed many times he'd, he'd, he'd die. He'd walk around talking to his uh, apostles and people. I'm going to die, but the third day I'll rise again. They never heard the third day I'll rise again part. You know, they, you're not going to die. You're not going to die. Even Peter tonight, you're not going to die. <clears throat> So after he rose from the dead, he walked around, if you read in Acts chapter 1, 40 days. He walked around all over the place for 40 days. Then he said, wait for the promise of my father, Acts chapter 2. On the 50th day, the Holy Spirit came. But anyway, for 40 days, he walked around. Here's one of those instances in Matthew 26. He intentionally met with his disciples. And this is very intentional. And here's what he says in Matthew 26, verse 63. He's meeting with the leaders and uh, uh, the, with the, the high priest and they're arresting him and everything. He has to first get arrested. You're under arrest. They think they're so smart. So the high priest starts questioning him. <clears throat> so the high priest, <clears throat> remember this is a human high priest, not the high priest. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, let's see. I charge you under oath by the living God, verse 63, tell us. If you are the Christ, the Messiah, the christened one, the Messiah, the Son of God. See, they knew exactly who the Christ would be. He'd be the Messiah, the Son of God. So they were, but they're looking right at him and they don't understand who he is. Because <clears throat> humans won't get it. So here's what Jesus said to them in verse 64. Yes. <laughs> just plain yes, it is as you say. So he's letting them say the confession. Yes, it's just like you said. But, I will say to all of you, in the future... You will see the Son of Man, Daniel chapter 7, verse 13 and 14. The Son of Man will be brought into the presence of God, holy. You will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven. Jesus is all sufficient, the Son of Man. He can forgive us for our sins. And then the fourth thing is this, it's also once for all, <clears throat> complete, finished work. Hebrews 7.27 Unlike other high priests, he does not need to offer sacrifices day after day for his own sins and then for the sins of the people. He sacrificed for their sins once for all when he offered himself. Once for all means literally it's for all time. Just once. Just once. In fact, Romans 6.10 says the death Jesus died, he died to sin once for for all. In fact, we all know that famous last words of Jesus on the cross, John 19, verse 30. It is finished. He only has to die once. You don't have to keep re-sacrificing Christ at the altar. He's already died once for us. Thank God he has provided such a sin offering for us. Jesus became our sin offering. Only one sacrifice, unrepeatable <clears throat> Thank God for such a complete, finished work. Now, the earthly priests never got finished. In fact, verse 28 in Hebrews 7 says, For the law appoints as high priests men who are weak. But the oath, coming from Psalm 110, which came after the law, appoints the son who's been made perfect forever. So we can compare the human beings as high priests to Jesus as being high priest. Compare the difference. The fallen humanity versus the second person of the Trinity representing us as a high priest. Or you could look at the old covenant which demands you got to do this, you got to do this, you got to do this. Nothing wrong with the covenant, but we can't keep it compared to the new covenant which says you enter through the door and you're saved. Jesus is our savior. We're no longer dependent on ourselves. We're completely dependent on Jesus. Praise God for that. So not only did Jesus, uh, Jesus did not fail and he, his sacrifice was once for all. And he on oath appointed the son, pure and blameless. Psalm 110, the Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever. 
in the order of Melchizedek. So for God to swear an oath, if it's written in the Bible, it's, it's, he doesn't have to swear an oath. He just can speak. But he wants us to get this. So he swears an oath. And the whole point is you will be perfect forever in him because his, his sacrifice is once for all. Jesus died once. The curtain tore top to bottom. It is finished. We can go right in now through Jesus, a permanent high priest, an all-powerful high priest, all-sufficient high priest, and his sacrifice is once for all. The fifth thing then, then he was seated at the right hand of God. Finished. Hebrews 8, verse 1. The point of what we are saying is this. We do not have such a high priest who sat down at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven. We have a different high priest, seated. Now in the temple, the tabernacle, there were no chairs. There were no seats. The priests were never to sit. They're always working and busy. Their job was never done. Hustle back and forth. They had the offering sacrifice for their own sins, sins for the people. And every day they were busy. They're running all over the place. A lot of busyness, scurrying around nonstop. Jesus is seated because his work is done, finished. And where Jesus is seated makes all the difference. He is seated at the highest authority in the universe, at the right hand of God, exercising the authority of the throne of God. The fact that the, the Messiah would sit at God's right hand is promised many times in the Old Testament. In Psalm 110 says, Essentially the same thing. Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Psalm 110. So it's a theme running all through scripture that Jesus the Messiah will be sitting at God's right hand. In fact, Ephesians, Paul spends three whole chapters in Ephesians 1, 2, and 3 describing our ID in Christ. Our identity. So important. You read the first three chapters. It's not until chapter 4, verse 1, that he tells you what to do. You got to know your ID first. So he spends three whole chapters. This is just jumping in right in the middle here. Chapter 1, verse 20 in Ephesians. <clears throat> Talking about the, the mighty strength and power, verse 20, which God exerted in Christ. Now think about that. Power that God exerted in Christ. If God can create the universe, think of what's happening on that cross. Which he exerted in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms. Far above all rule and authority and power and dominion. What is higher than God's throne? Uh, nothing. Okay. Every title and higher than every title that can be given not only in this present age but also in the age to come. And God placed all things then under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church. That's us. He's over us, which is his body. We're the body of Christ in the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. Jesus is all we need. <clears throat> who else could sit at God's right hand? Try it. <laughs> uh, I can name the most famous person in the world, the richest person in the world, lauds those, don't they? But their law, their law doesn't last. Once they die, they're going to be like everybody else. Jesus, though, is sitting at the right hand, and he represents us. In fact, Romans, the, uh, the grand crescendo of the book of Romans, part of it in the end of chapter 8, if God is for us, you know the rest, don't you? Who can be against us? We've got it. Now, here's the sixth one. Jesus is the real high priest. So chapter 8, verse 2. Jesus serves in the sanctuary, the true tabernacle set up by the Lord, not by man. Verse 3, every priest is appointed to offer gifts and sacrifices so that what was necessary for this one also to have something to offer. Verse 4, if he were on earth, he would not be a priest, for there are already men who offer gifts prescribed by the law. Verse 5, they serve at a sanctuary that is a copy or a shadow of what is in heaven. Remember, Moses had all those visions of in heaven and the copy was on earth. But what really counts is what's in heaven. So this is why Moses was warned when he was about to build the tabernacle. See to it that you make everything according to the pattern shown to you on the mountain. Think of the prophetic patterns that are on earth compared to what those prophetic patterns were pointing to. God's reality. It just earthly representation here for those tabernacle, the tabernacle system and the priesthood system. 
<clears throat> it's a major theme in the book of Hebrews. The Hebrew Christians were going backwards into all kinds of laws because that was their culture. So the Hebrews is written to get them to forget that and go forward. That's why the book of Hebrews is so complicated and you have to know a lot of the Old Testament to read the book of Hebrews. Some say it's, a, it's, a, it's an Old Testament book written in the, uh, besides the book of Revelation that is, the Old Testament book written in the New Testament. So Jesus' ministry was not on the basis of an earthly ministry. He's in heaven. <clears throat> Other priests were a shadow pointing to what they, uh, Jesus would represent. An earthly tabernacle is only temporary. It's imperfect. But the heavenly tabernacle is eternal, perfect, and real for eternity. Jesus is the real high priest, not a copy. Remember, the high priest could only go through the Holy of Holies once a year. And he had to be a descendant of Aaron. And he could only go in through once a year. And he could die if he went through that curtain wrong and then put the blood over. Now, Jesus is our high priest. That was just a sign. All this was planned and put in writing many ways in the Old Testament. Thousands of years before it happened. We can get to Luke 24. When Jesus rose from the dead. Remember, he walked around for 40 days. And met with people many times. Here's one meeting in the book of Luke 24. We'll just look at a couple of verses. Verse 44. <clears throat> He's meeting with the, the disciples. Can you imagine this? The resurrected Lord meeting with him. Anyway, verse 44 in Luke 24. This is what I told you while I was still with you. In other words, while I was walking around on earth, I was trying to explain this to you. Of course, they can't get it. They won't get it until Acts chapter 2 when the Holy Spirit comes. But anyway, this is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled what is written about me in the law of Moses. The prophet's and the Psalms. That's a Hebrew way of saying the Old Testament. You've heard the Tanakh, T-N-K. T is for the law, Torah. N is for uh, Nevi'im, the uh, pro- prophets. And K is for Ketuvim, the writings, the poetry, the Psalms. Tanakh, they call it the Tanakh. It's th- three words, they make one word, the Tanakh. So that's what Jesus is saying to them. Everything's written about me in the Tanakh must come true. The law of Moses, the prophets and the Psalms. Verse 45, then he did this miracle. He opened their minds so they could understand what are you just saying <laughs> we've had that happen to us haven't we been born again Acts chapter 2 it started so today we have the miracle of God's word working deep in our hearts now we have the last the seventh one Jesus is a priesthood he's superior he's all superior verse 6 then in Hebrews 8 The ministry Jesus has received is as superior to theirs as the covenant of which he is mediator is superior to the old one and is founded on better promises. You can compare the Old Testament with the New Testament. No one can keep the Old Testament. The the purpose of the Old Testament was so the Israel would stay uh, in one piece so the Messiah could come through them and also reveals the holiness of God. But once after a while, they just disappear. The covenant wouldn't work. So Jesus is a mediator of a superior covenant. The new covenant is founded on better promises. It's founded on that rock that is Christ, not on us. We trust in the rock. The Old Testament was the works of the law must be kept. The New Testament is all about grace. It's a gift promised on oath. So we can have the law or we can have grace. We can have the human effort or Jesus effort. We can have, uh, we can... Stuff we got to do or stuff that's already done, finished for us. We can, we can follow the copy of the shadow or what is real. We can have what's temporary or we can have what is eternal. We cannot add to Jesus because it only subtracts. If you add anything he has to do, it only subtracts. And we can't subtract from Jesus because then it only adds human failure. We can't do any of that math. We have to just accept God's wholeness in Christ. We don't have a religion Instead, we have a living relationship with him. Our world is always misunderstanding the gospel. When Jesus was teaching in the book of John, they would always misunderstand him. And it was done on purpose, I believe. And uh, For instance, um, he would use many metaphors and figures of speech. <clears throat> John chapter 2, talking to the religious leaders. Destroy this temple, I'll raise it again in three days. It took us 46 years to build this temple. You know, no, he's talking about his body. Temple in our body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. Chapter 3, he's talking to Nicodemus. Nicodemus, you'll never see the kingdom of God unless you're born again. How can I go back into my mother's womb and be... No, he's talking about rebirth through the Holy Spirit. He talks to the woman at the well. Listen, if you would have known what I have, I would have given you living water instead of this water. You don't even have a bucket. 
No, he's talking about the Holy Spirit that will be with him rising up. He's talking to disciples later in John chapter 4. I have food to eat you know nothing about. They didn't really know what he's doing. Well, give us, uh, what, who brought him food? No, I have food you know nothing about. My food is to do the will of him who sent me. From now on, give us this food. And Jesus said, I am the bread of life. John chapter 6. So we have that miracle. I just want to end with this one. John chapter 1. Just a, John chapter 1, John gives a powerful description of what we have in Christ in verse 12 and 13. Not everybody will receive Jesus, isn't that correct? But those who do receive him, verse 13, verse 12, to all who receive him, to believe, those who believe in his name, his authority, who he is, he gives the right that means authority to become children of God. We don't do it ourselves. It's a gift. You receive Jesus. You have to say yes to Jesus. When you say yes to him, you become a child of God. That changes everything. Now verse 13 has three disclaimers. <clears throat> children born not of natural descent. Remember, you've got to be born again. Not of human decision. It's, it's a miracle. Or of a husband's will. It had nothing to do with natural. But you have to be born of God. God. Once you do that, uh, you have received God's miracle, and the amazing grace of God has got you covered. Now, I know our emotions go up and down, the reality and the problems in the world go up and down, but our relationship will never end. God has got us covered. We're going to spend a little time in prayer and worship right now and just seek to get close to the Lord and, and just allow the Holy Spirit to meditate, or meditate on the Holy Spirit and allow Him just to get into your heart. And bring encouragement and faith. We live a miracle life as believers. And it is 